This week we continue talking about systems of linear differential equations. We're going to talk about fundamental matrices and then we're going to talk about the situation of repeated eigenvalues. Last week we looked at the easiest case of repeated eigenvalues where we still had n linearly independent eigenvectors. This week we'll look to see what can we do if we have repeated eigenvalues and we don't have enough linearly independent eigenvectors. But first, fundamental matrices. In this section, we're going to be considering the differential equation. X prime is equal to P of T X, where P will be some N by N matrix function. We're going to suppose that we know n linearly independent solutions to this differential equation. In other words, we're going to assume that we have a fundamental set of solutions to this differential equation. This matrix, the matrix where the first column is the first solution and then the second column is the second solution, the third column is the third solution, etc. It's called a fundamental matrix of the differential equation. In other words, we take our fundamental set of solutions and then instead of writing them as separate vector functions, we squash them all together and we write them as a matrix. Let me say again, the first column is the first solution the second column is the second solution, and so on. For example, find a fundamental matrix for the linear system of differential equations, or we can just call it call the differential equation. X prime is equal to the matrix 1141 X. We need to find two linear independent solutions, and then we're going to write a matrix using these as the columns. We already know a fundamental set of solutions to this system, to this equation, because we looked at it last week. We know that 1, 2 multiplied by e to the power of 3t and 1 minus 2 multiplied by e to the power of minus t are solutions to this. And let me remind you, this is eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t. And then again, eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue, in this case the eigenvalue is minus 1, t. We're going to take these functions and we're going to write them as columns of a matrix. So we have the matrix where the first column is e3t to e3t, I'm multiplying 1, 2 by e to the 3t, and the second column I'm multiplying the vector 1 minus 2 by e to the power minus t to get e to the power of minus t and minus 2 e to the power of minus t. This is a fundamental matrix of this differential equation. Now, the general solution to x prime is equal to ax, where a is a square matrix of constants, a will be a member of R n cross n, an n by n square matrix of numbers. Remember that the general solution is a linear combination of the elements of the fundamental set of solutions. We can write this in terms of matrices. This is equal to the fun a fundamental matrix multiplied by a constant vector, where the constant vector is the vector c1, c2, up to cn. If we think about this, take our square matrix, multiply it by c, we get exactly c1, x1, plus c2, x2, etc. In other words, instead of writing our general solution in this long way, we could just write our general solution as fundamental matrix multiplied by a constant vector. If we have an initial condition, let's say we know that 
x at time t0 is equal to x0. Put t0 here, put x0 over here, and we have the fundamental matrix calculated at time t0 multiplied by the constant c is equal to the initial condition x0. Put these two equations at the top. The general solution is x is equal to the fundamental matrix multiplied by a constant, and the initial condition gives us the fundamental matrix at time t0 multiplied by the constant is equal to x0. But what, what can we say? Because we have a fundamental set of solutions, we have linearly independent vectors. We have linearly independent vectors. That means that we have a matrix where each of the columns are linearly independent. That means we have an invertible matrix. We have an invertible matrix, then we can take the equation at the top. Instead of writing fundamental matrix, C is equal to x0, I could apply the inverse of the fundamental matrix to both sides and get that the constant is equal to the inverse of the fundamental matrix calculated at point t0 multiplied by x0. As soon as we have a formula for c in terms of the initial condition, we can stick this into the general solution. And we can say that the solution to the initial value problem, x prime is equal to ax, x at time t0 is x0, is fundamental matrix at time t multiplied by the inverse of the fundamental matrix at time t0 multiplied by the initial condition x0. The theorem, first theorem of today's lesson. Suppose that capital psi, this Greek letter, if you're not familiar, is a capital letter psi. Suppose that we have a fundamental matrix for x prime is equal to pt of x. Then this fundamental matrix solves the same differential equation. It solves that the derivative of the fundamental matrix is equal to pt multiplied by the fundamental matrix. Intuitively, this is easy to understand because each column of the fundamental matrix is a solution of the equation. Each column solves the equation, then we can, we can guess that the whole matrix solves the equation. And in fact, that's true. I'm going to leave the proof of this theorem for you to write down. If I was given giving homework for this course, I'd probably ask you to prove this as part of your homework. But we can't do that on a multiple choice homework, of course. But have a go. You should be able to write down the proof of this theorem. There's another idea in this section, which is the idea of a special fundamental matrix. It's possible to find a special fundamental matrix, capital Phi. This is the Greek letter, capital Phi, which satisfies that capital Phi at T0 is equal to the identity matrix. We're going to use the notation capital Phi for this special fundamental matrix, and we're going to use the notation capital Psi for any fundamental matrix. Let me note before I go on, there are infinitely many fundamental matrices for a differential equation, but only one of them is the special one which has the property that phi at time t0 is equal to the identity. The 
when I write questions, you'll see that sometimes I say find a fundamental matrix, and then there's infinitely many correct answers. You could give any one of those as your answer. Sometimes I will ask for the special fundamental matrix. If I ask for the special fundamental matrix, then there's only one correct answer to the question. For example, consider x prime is equal to 1, 1, 4, 1, x. Find the special fundamental matrix which satisfies the condition phi at 0 is equal to the identity. We want to find the matrix phi which satisfies this condition. To, to answer this, we need to solve two initial conditions two initial value problems. To make the left column one zero, we need to find the solution which satisfies x at zero is equal to one zero. And then to make the second column equal to zero one, we need to solve the same initial value problem but with the initial condition x of zero is equal to zero one. After we know these two solutions, We'll have two linearly independent solutions. We'll have a fundamental set of solutions. The first one will give us one zero at time zero, and the second one at time zero will give us the column zero one. We know the general solution to this differential equation. We need to choose the constant so that we match the initial conditions 1, 0, and 0, 1. First, to get the left column, we need to solve the initial condition 1, 0 is equal to x, 0. And I'll leave it to you to check that this means we must have the constants a half and a half. So the first solution must be a half e to the power of 3t plus a half e to the power of minus t, e to the power of 3t minus e to the power of minus t. And then we do the same calculation, but using the initial condition x of 0 is equal to 0, 1. And this time we find that the constants we need are a quarter and minus a quarter. So the second function that we want is the function a quarter e to the 3t minus a quarter e to the power minus t, a half e to the 3t plus a half e to the power minus t, which I will leave for you to check. Now that we know these two functions, we can write down the special fundamental matrix. And here it is. The first function gives us the first column, and the second function gives us the second column. Next idea, e to the power a t, where a is a matrix. How can we do e to the power of a matrix? You will recall that the solution to x prime is equal to a x, where the initial condition x of 0 is equal to x 0, is equal to x 0 multiplied by e to the power a t, or x 0 multiplied by the exponential function of 80, where, if you recall the first year calculus, the Taylor series is the exponential function of 80 is 1 plus the sum from 1 to infinity, a to the power n, t to the power n over n factorial. We're going to use the same idea. We're going to be using this formula as the definition of e to the power a t, where capital A is a matrix. I want to consider x prime is equal to a x, where the initial condition x of 0 is equal to x 0, for some constant n by n matrix. And I'm going to use this formula as the definition of the exponential function of capital A of t. There's one small difference from this to the previous one. 
If it was e to the power number, small at, we had one plus a sum. For matrices, we can't have a number one. Instead, we start with the identity matrix i. But other than that, the formula is the same. It's i plus the sum from 1 to infinity, a to the power n, t to the power n, divided by n factorial. Now note, what happens if we differentiate this formula? The derivative of the exponential of 80. That's the derivative of i, which of course is just 0, plus the derivative of this, this sum. For this course, we're not going to worry about radi radii of convergences. When can we take a derivative inside a sum? We're just going to assume that for this function, it's OK to take the derivative inside the sum. Derivative i is 0. Take the derivative inside the sum. We have the sum of the derivative of a n t n divided by n factorial. And of course, the derivative of t to the power n is n t to the power n minus 1. N cancels with the n at the bottom, and we end up with a n t to the power n minus 1 divided by n minus 1 factorial. There's an n minus 1, there's an n minus 1. I want an n minus 1 just here, so I'm going to take one factor of a outside the sum. Well, I actually did this a slightly different way. Instead of a sum starting at 1, I want to have a sum that starts at 2. The first term I'm going to take out, and then all of the other terms I'm going to have as a term starting at 2. And then I'm going to do a substitution. Instead of writing n minus 1 each time, I'm going to replace every n minus 1 with k. So instead of n minus 1 on the bottom, we have k on the bottom. Instead of t to the power n minus 1, we have t to the power k. And instead of a to the power n, we have a to the power k plus 1. There's one more thing to note here. Instead of starting at n e equal to 2, we start at k is equal to 2 minus 1. We start at k is equal to 1. That's just a substitution. And then we can factor out a. Take one a outside of the bracket, and we get i plus, and instead of a to the power k plus 1, we have a to the power k. But what's this in the bracket? This is exactly what we started with. i plus a, a sum from 1 to infinity, a to the power k, t to the power k over k factorial. So we actually have a multiplied by the exponential of 80. Using this formula with a matrix a instead of a number a, it still works. Still, the derivative of e to the power 80 is a e to the power 80. This means that the exponential of 80 solves this initial value problem. The derivative of the exponential of 80 is equal to a, exponential of 80. We've just shown that. If we take the formula and we put t equal to 0, I'll go back. If we take this formula in the blue box and we replace t by 0, when everything in this sum is 0, and we just end up with i. So we have exponential of at at time t equal to 0 is equal to i. There's one more function which also solves this. Remember that the special fundamental matrix capital Phi, there's a typo here, this should be capital Phi, 
also solves capital Phi prime is equal to a capital Phi with the initial condition capital Phi at zero is equal to I. So these are the same function. The special fundamental matrix and the exponential function are the same function. There's one detail that I've skipped over here. This is true if the initial condition time t0 is equal to the number 0. If we had an initial condition at a different time, then this wouldn't be true. You only have that the special fundamental matrix is equal to the exponential function if we have our initial condition at time 0. So I should perhaps add just here, if t0 is equal to 0. Let's do an example. Let capital A be 8, minus 1, 6, 1. Find the exponential function of a t. This is just asking us, find the special fundamental matrix. We've previously found the general solution to this equation. Here it is. We need to solve the initial conditions so that the first column gives us 1, 0, and the second column gives us 0, 1. I'm going to skip past the details. I'm leaving this for you to check. To make the first column 1, 0, we need to have the constants 6 over 5 and minus 1 over 5. So we have 6 over 5 multiplied by 1, 1, e to the power 70, minus 1 over 5 multiplied by 1, 6, e to the power 2, t, which we can combine together like this. And then we're going to do the same thing for the second column to make the initial condition 0, 1. In order to make the initial condition 0, 1, the constants that we want are minus a fifth and plus a fifth. Again, I leave this for you to check. Put these constants into the formula and we get this orange function. Now that we know these two functions, we can write down the special fundamental matrix. In other words, we can write down the exponential of a t. And here it is. With an exponential function of AT, which is the same as the special fundamental matrix, is this matrix where the first column is the green function and the second column is the orange function. And I'll leave it for you to check that in this formula, if we calculate the exponential function of A multiplied by 0, then we get the identity matrix. Let me remind you about diagonalizable matrices. Those of you who have done your linear algebra revision will be, be familiar with these ideas, but I'll repeat them if necessary. If D is a diagonalizable diagonal matrix, that's a matrix where on the main diagonal, we have some numbers which may or may not be non-zero. Every other number must be zero. If we have a diagonal matrix, then it's easy to calculate the exponential of dt. And I'll leave it for you to check from the formula, from the definition. Because d to the power n m, say, is just R1 to the power M, 0, 0, R2 to the power M, etc., etc. We also have the same idea for the exponential function of dt. It's e to the power R1t, e to the power R2, t, e to the power R3t, etc., down the main diagonal, and every other number is 0.
Now let's go back to our differential equation. x prime is equal to ax, where a is a constant square matrix. I want to remind you how we diagonalize a matrix. If we know that the eigenvectors of A are xi1, xi2 up to xi n, then we define the, a transition matrix, capital T, to be the matrix where the first column is xi1, the second column is xi2, etc. As long as the determinant of t is not zero, in other words, if we have linearly independent eigenvectors, then the inverse of t exists. And then t inverse at is a diagonal matrix. In this case, we say that a is diagonalizable. If we have linearly independent eigenvectors, then A is diagonalizable. For example, diagonalize the matrix A is equal to 1, 1, 4, 1. Again, we've looked at this matrix before. We looked at this last week. The eigenvalues are 3 and minus 1. The corresponding eigenvectors are 1, 2 and 1, minus 2. So T is the matrix where the first column is the first eigenvector. And the second column is the second eigenvector. And I'll just tell you that this matrix is invertible, and I'll tell you that the inverse of T is a half, a quarter, a half, minus a quarter. I'm sure you know how to calculate the inverse of a two by two matrix. It follows that T inverse AT is a diagonal matrix, and you will recall from your linear algebra lessons that it's the diagonal matrix where the entries on the main diagonal are the eigenvalues 3 and minus 1. Go back to the general equation again. x prime is equal to ax. There's an important idea in this method, so let me slow down and repeat myself. The important idea in this method is that we're going to define a new variable y by x is equal to ty. Or to say this another way, we're defining the new variable y to be equal to t inverse of x. When we use the method of diagonalization, and I'll be repeating this next week, the key idea, the way we always start, is we start with the new variable y satisfies x is equal to ty, or equivalently y is equal to t inverse. We're going to substitute this into our differential equation. We're starting with x prime is equal to ax. And then I'm going to replace each x by ty. Instead of x prime, I have ty prime. Instead of ax, I have ATY. Multiply both sides by the inverse of t. Y prime is equal to T inverse ATY, but that's just DY. When we make this substitution, when we substitute in X is equal to TY, we change our differential equation into a different differential equation. We change it into Y prime is equal to DY, where now we have a diagonal matrix. 
we know a fundamental matrix for y prime is equal to d1. We know that a fundamental matrix is just the exponential function of dt. And if we have a diagonal matrix, it's very easy to write down the exponential function of dt. It's just the diagonal matrix where the entries on the main diagonal are e to the power eigenvalue t. Then we substitute back. I will remind you that we're making the substitution x is equal to ty. Now we know why. More precisely, we know a fundamental matrix which we can use to find y. Multiply it by t. And we have a fundamental matrix which we can use to find x. In other words, a fundamental matrix for the equation that we started with is t multiplied by the exponential fun function of dt. For example, Find a fundamental matrix for x prime is equal to 1, 1, 4, 1, x. We've already answered this question, but now we're going to do it again using this new method. This new method will be useful next week when we look at non-homogeneous linear systems. I will remind you of T. We're going to make the substitution y is equal to t inverse x. We always do the same substitution if we use this method of diagonalization. And then we have the easier linear system y prime is equal to 3, 0, 0, minus 1, y. As soon as we know the eigenvalues of our matrix, we can write down D because it's just a diagonal matrix where the entries on the main diagonal are the eigenvalues. We can find a fundamental matrix for this equation. The exponential function of DT, or writing this another way, e to the power of DT. 3 becomes e to the power of 3T and minus one becomes e to the power minus two. Straight away, we're writing this down. As soon as we know a fundamental matrix for the y equation, we can write down a fundamental matrix for the x equation. All we're going to do is we're going to take our exponential function of dt, and we're going to multiply on the left by t. So it's going to be 1, 1, 2, minus 2, multiplied by e to the power 3t, 0, 0, e to the power minus 2, or this function. And this is exactly the same as we got before. For an easy system like this, you might be thinking, so what? What does, how, what does this new method give us? The answer is that when we look at more complicated linear systems next week, this method of diagonalization will become useful. But that's for next week. The second idea for this week's lesson is the idea of repeated eigenvalues. And it's going to be repeated eigenvalues when we don't have n linearly independent eigenvectors. To start with, find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of 1 minus 1, 1, 3. This should be revision for you. We start with the equation determined of a minus our i is equal to 0. And we calculate, we get 0 is equal to r minus 2 squared. So the eigenvalue is a repeated 2. We have repeated eigenvalues. Then we try to find the eigenvectors. 
for eigenvectors, we start with the equation zero vectors equals a minus ri xi. And we find that we must have xi1 plus xi2 is zero. One possible eigenvector is one minus one. You will note that we only have one eigenvector. Every other eigenvector is a multiple of this vector. It's not possible to find two linearly independent eigenvectors. Solve x prime x one minus one one three x. Well, we know one solution. We know eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t. But we have a two by two matrix, so we need two linearly independent solutions. How can we find a second solution? Let's make a guess. Guess number one, here's a clue for you, it's not going to work. We use the same ideas from chapter three. We're going to take our previous function and we're going to multiply it by t. And maybe it's not the same vector. Let's suppose there's some vector which we don't know yet. Put this into the equation. x2 prime is equal to a x2. X2 prime is xi e to the power 2t plus 2 xi t e to the power 2t. And a multiplied by x2 is a xi t e to the power 2t. Every term includes e to the power 2t. We can cancel these out. And we're left, after we rearrange, with xi plus 2 xi minus a xi t is equal to 0. And we need this to be true for all time t. For example, we need it to be true for t equal to 0. t is equal to 0, all of this cancels, and we end up with xi is equal to 0. But if xi is equal to 0, then the function we start with is just 0. And that's no good. That's not linearly independent from the function that we started with. This guess did not work. Let's try again. Let's make another guess. We're expecting our guess should have e to the power of 2t in because 2 is the eigenvalue. We're expecting to have to include a t in here somewhere. And we're expecting some vectors to be in here, some vector xi and some vector eta. We're going to substitute this into our differential equation, and then we're going to try to find xi and eta. x2 prime is now xi e to the power 2t plus 2 xi t e to the power 2t plus 2 eta e to the power 2t. And on the right side, we have a multiplied by xi t e to the power 2t plus eta e to the power 2t. Okay. Again, everything includes an e to the power of 2t. We could cross these all out. And rearrange slightly. 2 xi minus a xi t plus xi plus 2 eta minus a eta is equal to the zero vector. And this must be true for all time. Again, if we put t equal to 0 in, the first thing would, would vanish, and the second bracket must be equal to 0.
But if the second bracket is equal to zero, and we say we, we replace t by one, then we have two xi minus a xi is equal to zero. So the first bracket must also be equal to zero. So we have two equations we need to satisfy. A minus two i xi is equal to zero, and a minus two i eta is equal to xi. First equation looks familiar. The first equation is the equation for an eigenvector. So xi must be an eigenvector. And then we have a similar but not exactly the same second equation to find eta. These are the two important equations, so I'm putting these at the top. This will stay here for the time being. Clearly, if xi is an eigenvector, then we can have xi is 1 minus 1. We need to find eta. We calculate a minus 2i. That's minus 1 minus 1, 1, 1, multiplied by eta is equal to xi, or 1 minus 1. Both lines, top line and the second line, give us the equation eta 1 plus eta 2 is equal to minus 1. So eta must look like k minus 1 minus k for some number k. Or we can split this up to... 0 minus 1 plus k1 minus 1. Substitute these into our second solution. x2 is xi t, e to the power 2t, plus e to e to the power 2t. Put these vectors in and we have this. Or we have 1 minus 1 t e to the power 2t plus 0 minus 1 e to the power 2t plus a constant multiplied by x1. Now, wait a minute, we're trying to find a solution which is linearly independent from x1. Having plus a multiple of x1 doesn't help us. You don't need this part. This doesn't make us linearly independent from x1. So we could choose k equal to 0 if we wanted to. Then we would have 1 minus 1, t e to the power 2t, plus 0 minus 1, e to the power 2t. Now that we have our two solutions, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation. And the general solution, of course, is constant x1 plus constant x2. That's constant multiplied by 1 minus 1 e to the power 2t plus constant multiplied by open brackets 1 minus 1t e to the power 2t plus 0 minus 1 e to the power 2t. It's always e to the power 2t because our eigenvalue is 2. We have our 1 minus 1 here and here because this is the eigenvector. And then we have t because we need an extra t in here to make the second function, and then to make it work, we have to have this extra vector, eta. Next example, find a fundamental matrix for x prime is equal to 1 minus 1, 1, 3, x. Then, in the second part of the question, find the special fundamental matrix, which satisfies capital phi of 0 is equal to i. This is a two-part question. First, find any fundamental matrix, and then part two, find the special fundamental matrix.
is our two functions, a green function and an orange function. As soon as we know these, we can write down a fundamental matrix. Make the first column the green function and the second column the orange function. And then we have a fundamental matrix for this system. The second part of this question, we want to find the special fundamental matrix. I've written this at the top. This is a fundamental matrix. We want to find the special one next. Note what happens if we set t equal to zero, we get one, zero, minus one, minus one. And then the inverse of this matrix is one, zero, minus one, minus one. The exponential function of AT, or the special fundamental matrix we're trying to find, is the fundamental matrix where if we set T equal to zero, we get the identity matrix. Using the ideas from before, we can solve an initial value problem in terms of matrices. We can calculate fundamental matrix at time T, multiplied by the inverse of the fundamental matrix at the initial condition, multiplied by the initial condition, which we want is i. So we get e to the power of 2t multiplied by 1t minus 1 minus 1 minus t, multiplied by the inverse of the fundamental matrix at time 0, which is 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1. Multiply all of these together and we get our answer. e to the power of 2t, 1 minus t minus t, t, 1 plus t. Quickly check what happens if we put t equal to 0. e to the power of 2t is 1, so we, can, we don't need to worry about that. 1 minus 0 is 1, minus 0 is 0. 0 is 0, and 1 plus 0 is 1. We get the identity matrix. Let's recap these ideas. Let's suppose we're trying to solve x prime is equal to ax, and we have two repeated eigenvalues, but we have only one linearly independent eigenvector then there's two key equations to remember. For the second solution, we always want xi t e to the power r t plus eta e to the power r t, where xi is the eigenvector and eta is the second vector which satisfies the equation a minus r i eta is equal to xi. We have a name for this second vector, eta. Eta is called a generalized eigenvector of A. So we need the, an eigenvector, xi, and a generalized eigenvector, eta. As soon as we find xi, r, xi, and eta, we can write down the general solution. So the method is this. We have two repeated values, but only one linearly independent eigenvector. Step one, find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The first solution is eigenvector multiplied by e to the power eigenvalue t. Step three, we need to find a generalized eigenvector eta. And we use the equation a minus r eta is equal to xi. And then we know that the second solution is eigenvector t, e to the power eigenvalue t, plus generalized eigenvector e to the power eigenvalue t. Let's do an example. Solve the initial value problem. x prime is equal to minus 5 over 2, 3 over 2, 
minus 3 over 2, 1 over 2x, with the initial condition x of 0 is equal to 3 minus 1. I'm going to tell you that the, there's only one eigenvalue of this matrix, so that's minus 1. And I'm going to tell you that the corresponding, a corresponding eigenvector is 1, 1. As soon as we know that, we know one solution is 1, 1 e to the power minus t. We need to find a second linearly independent solution. So we need a generalized eigenvector. We're going to be using the ansatz xi t e to the power minus t plus eta e to the power minus t, where xi is 1, 1, as before. That's the eigenvector. And eta is this generalized eigenvector that we need to find. We need to solve a minus ri, eta is equal to xi. Put the numbers in. I'll leave it for you to check that a minus ri is minus 3 over 2, 3 over 2, minus 3 over 2, 3 over 2, e to 1, e to 2 is equal to 1, 1. So we need e to 1 and e to 2 to satisfy the equation. Minus 3 over 2 e to 1 plus 3 over 2 e to 2 is equal to 1. Or simplify this a little bit. Minus e to 1 plus e to 2 is equal to 2 thirds. We can choose any vector that we want. Last time I did this, I put a constant k in, and then I saw k doesn't matter. We could just choose k is equal to 0. So let's go straight away. Instead of wasting time doing that, let's just straight away say we can have zero if we want to. To make a nice easy fun vector, I'm going to choose e to one is zero. If e to one is zero, then e to two must be two thirds. Let me just repeat what I just said. We don't need to find every generalized eigenvector. We only need to find one of them. So if we wanted to find every generalized eigenvector, we would start by putting a constant k in. We would have k, k plus two thirds, or k multiplied by one, one, plus zero, two thirds, or k multiplied by the eigenvector xi plus zero, two thirds. But we already know the solution xi e to the power rt, so we don't need another xi e to the power rt. So we can just choose k is equal to 0. We only need to find one generalized eigenvector. So because I like simple numbers, I'm choosing the first coordinate to be 0, and then I, see, I find that the second coordinate must be 2 thirds. The generalized eigenvector that I'm using is going to be 0, 2 thirds. If I gave you a question which was just to find a general solution to a differential equation like this, then there would be infinitely many correct answers depending on which eigenvector and which generalized eigenvectors you choose. If I gave you an initial value problem question, however, there would be only one correct answer because once we choose the constant C1 and C2, that cancels out any choice that you made earlier. And if you haven't made any mistakes, you always get exactly the same answer. So. What do we know? We know that the eigenvalue is minus 1. We have our eigenvector 1, 1. And we have our generalized eigenvector 0, 2 thirds. As soon as we have eigenvalue, eigenvector, and generalized eigenvector, we can write down our two solutions. 
And then after we know our two solutions, we can write down the general solution. We've almost finished this problem. We've, we've been asked to solve an initial value problem, so we need to choose the constants C1 and C2. The initial condition was x of 0 is equal to 3 minus 1. And this implies that we need the constants 3 and minus 6. So we can write down the solution to the initial value problem. If we wanted to, we could write it down as the, as the form 3 multiplied by 1, 1 e to the power minus t, minus 6 multiplied by 1, 1 t e to the power minus t, plus 0, 2 thirds e to the power minus t. But I would prefer if we simplify this a little bit, move all of the e to the power minus t terms together, we get 3 minus 1. That's 3 multiplied by 1, 1, minus 6 multiplied by 0, 2 thirds. Um, you will notice this is the initial condition. And then we get minus 6, 1, 1, t, e to the power minus t. Let's do another example. Solve x prime is equal to 1 minus 4, 4 minus x, with the initial condition x of 0 is equal to 3, 2. I'm going to tell you that the eigenvalue is minus 3. There's only one eigenvalue. And there's only one linearly independent eigenvector, which again is 1, 1. I was asked the previous year, why is it 1, 1 again? It's just a coincidence. There's no reason that two examples in a row should have the same eigenvector. It's just a coincidence that the vectors, the, that the matrices I've chosen both had the same eigenvector. We can write down the first solution is 1, 1 e to the power minus 3, 2. To write down the second solution, we need a generalized eigenvector. So we start with our formula, a minus ri eta is equal to xi. Put the numbers in, that's 4 minus 4, 4 minus 4, e to 1, e to 2 is equal to 1, 1 or 4e to 1 minus 4e to 2 is equal to 1. We can choose any vector which satisfies this equation. We only need to find one generalized eigenvector. We can rearrange the equation to e to 2 is equal to e to 1 minus a quarter. Choose one of these numbers to be zero, it doesn't matter. Let's say we choose e to one to be zero. And we could choose, for example, the generalized eigenvector zero minus a quarter. There are infinitely many correct answers at this point, infinitely many generalized eigenvectors. Choose any one that you want. I like to choose the first number to be zero if possible, and then I calculate the second number. So to recap, we have the eigenvector 1, 1 and the generalized eigenvector 0 minus a quarter. As soon as we know those, we can write down that the second solution is 1, 1 t e to the power 3 t plus 0 minus a quarter e to the power minus 3 t. And then we can write down the general solution. Constant multiplied by the green function plus a constant multiplied by this orange function. To finish the question, we need to find the constants C1 and C2. The initial condition in the given in the question was that I wanted x0 to be equal to 3, 2. To 
satisfy this, we need to have the constants 3 and 4. So we can calculate the solution to the initial value problem. And this is a correct answer, but I want to simplify this a little bit. I could write this as 3, 2, e to the power of minus 3t plus 4, 1, 1, t e to the power of 3t. Or I could write this as 3 plus 4t, 2 plus 4t, e to the power of minus 3t. And we've come to the end of this week's lesson. Next week is the final lesson. Next week we will study non-homogeneous linear systems. And I can tell you that next week's lesson will be more, one of the more difficult lessons. So I'm going to make it a sh next week's lesson a shorter lesson. Next week's lesson will only be 40 or 45 minutes long. Are there any questions? I'm going to check my calendar. Yes, the most recent information I received was it was on the 16th at half past 12, but Please check that to see if the Dean's office changes that. Okay.